it is awareful with the light of awareness that is the reality and there are no attributes in it that's why it is nirguna and it is supreme para and it is beyond space and time brahman that is the reality and uh, the light of that reality in fact reality is the light it reflects in the mind this is the mind and now mind instead of trying to find its source it goes to shopping for sense pleasures this is samsara this is uh, moksha so we were looking at that verse ana eva manushyanam karanam bandha moksha yo that is the verse and it is written below it's an interesting chart you may want to uh, look at it more closely i keep it here and uh, here is a gentleman's glasses and his book is welcome to come and take it any time om shri gurubhyo namaha hari hi om stuti smruti purana nam alayam namame bhagavat pada shankaram loka shankaram shastra sya guru vakya sya सत्यबुद्ध्यावधारणा सा श्रद्धा कथिता सद्भि यया वस्तुपलभ्यते सो वी हैव कम टू द क्वालिटी कॉल्ड श्रद्धा श्रद्धा इज द क्वालिटी ऑफ द माइंड दीज आर ऑल क्वालिटीज ऑफ द माइंड सो डिफरेंट एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ लाइफ आर टेकन and how the mind approaches a given aspect of life so that becomes a quality of the mind so the mind approaches the life a given aspect in one way and gets agitated and sorrowful the same aspect mind approaches in a more intelligent way mind becomes quiet peaceful and happy that is what it is so if human mind um has a tendency of samshaya samshaya is not raising a doubt or asking a question that is not samshaya samshaya is a doubtfulness doubtfulness what we call doubting thomas you know doubting thomas that 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 is the mind doubting thomas so uh the attitude is to doubt everything so you must have seen something called procrastination the postpone postponement is different you postpone something that you do when you examine the given situation and therefore the job this is not the right time to do the job and therefore you take a conscious decision to postpone it that is correct when uh, things are not ready you don't want to postpone therefore you start you are making a mistake therefore when it is needed to postpone you should postpone but procrastination is different that is not postponement procrastination is everything is there in place and it is time to do but due to laziness or whatever or you are unsure of yourself very uncertain of yourself and uh, samshayatma therefore you don't do it you go on delay it, delaying it this is called procrastination you see uh, i give you an example suppose you put a grain there this birds are there you know birds put a grain or some grains the bird uh, look at a pigeon it sees the grains and it wants the grains therefore what it does you know it believes you 
and comes and picks up the grains and goes away. Whereas, uh, you do the same thing with a crow. Did you notice a crow any time? It uh, notices the grains and it wants them, but it is uh, very doubtful of you or of itself or whatever. You, you cannot enter into the head of the crow. You have to just observe its behavior. So, the crow is the best example for doubting Thomas. So, don't be like a crow. So, I told you the negative and the positive is a Shraddha. The negative is Samshaya Atma. Atma is intellect, mind. Not Atma, Chidananda Atma. So, Samshaya Atma. So, a, a, a doubting Thomas. The opposite of that attitude is the attitude of Shraddha. But in Shraddha is not belief. Shraddha is not belief. Belief is never to be taken as a Shraddha. There is another Sanskrit word for belief. It is called Vishwasaha. It is different. Belief is different. In belief, you do not understand anything and you don't want to understand anything. And uh, believe in it. You know what is belief. So, but Shraddha is not belief. The word is Shraddha, Shraddha. Dha is the verb, you know. Dudhai dharana poshana yoho. That which holds together, dharana. That which nourishes poshana. So, that is a dha. Shrad. What is a shrad? Shraditi satyanama. So, shrad is the name for sat. Uh, for, for the truth, satya. So, name means the word which means that. That is how the word nama is used. It's not that Mr. John, like that, the, the truth has put a name for itself. Not like that. So, shrad means the truth. So, the reality, what is, that is the shrad. And that attitude of the mind, uh, which holds the truth together for itself, which keeps the truth in itself, dha, and also which helps, uh, which nourishes the truth. So, that kind of an attitude of mind is called shraddha. So, shraddha, so literally translated as that attitude of the mind which holds on to the truth, that is called shraddha. So, uh, therefore, you should first know that you are seeking the truth. You should seek the truth. Then only Shraddha comes into picture. Suppose you are seeking a desire, some desired object you are seeking, and uh, worshipping a, a particular form of God for fulfillment of the desire. There what you have is not so much of Shraddha, what you have is belief. And uh, People are committed to their beliefs. People love what they believe. Once you love, once you believe in a thing, your entire uh, emphasis will be on that thing. But there, you are not uh, seeking the truth. You are only seeking some silly worldly thing. So, therefore, you may not want to use the word Shraddha there. But if you want to use the word Shraddha in that context to mean whatever it means in that context, you are welcome. It is not about, I, I am not contesting the word. So, uh, you, you can use the word. If it fits into the context and if that is what you wanted to say, you are welcome to use it. So, but the word here is, uh, it must be, you must be pursuing the truth. Then only the word applies. And then, uh, you are uh, taking help from a realized soul. He is helping you. So, see, in Vedanta, what we call Brahma Lakshanam. We don't say Brahmanaha Nirvachanam. It is not the definition of Brahma. It is the Lakshanam. You know, Lakshanam means Lakshayati iti Lakshanam. That which shows. If I have to, if I have to translate the word Lakshanam, I would translate it as the pointing finger. That is the Lakshanam. Brahma Lakshanam hota hai. Brahma nirvachanam nahi hota hai. So, satyam jnanam anantam is the lakshana of the Brahma. 
it is pointing out in the direction of exploration, in which direction you have to explore to eventually arrive at the truth, that is being pointed out. That is the direction. So the pointing finger. And so the one who has such a pointing finger is the guru. Suppose if you take the pointing, pointing finger for the moon, like the, somebody is pointing to the moon and you want to know the moon, and then, uh, so this is the moon. Like that he points. And uh, you take the finger to be the moon. Then what happens, you know, you miss the moon. So, therefore, you, you look at the guru as the pointing finger, and uh, then uh, the guru loves you when you use his uh, teaching for knowing the truth, and then you have that uh, love for the truth, and uh, love for the pointing finger, reverence for the guru, and uh, you have a commitment to your journey, uh, if you can call it journey. Because uh, the problem is, suppose you call it journey, then journey involves time. It is time bomb. But then truth is not time bomb, and truth is timeless, therefore you have a problem there. Therefore you have to say, it is a journey unlike any other journey. You have to, you have to know that way. Therefore, uh, so in this journey, you are supposed to have that uh, proper attitude towards the vision as it is expounded by a realized soul. The vision. So, when we call Shastra, what is Shastra? The word Shastra, Shamsati Iti Shastram. That which tells you. Shamsati Iti Shastram. Shamsanat Shastram. That is the etymology. That which tells you. Shastram is not a particular book printed by a given publishing house. That is not what Shastram is. Maybe Shastram is there also, but Shastram is that which tells you where to see, how to see, what to see. That is the Shastra. And then the Guru is the one who shows the, the truth to you. So, who helps you to see the truth, who shows the truth. And so you should have love for the Shastra and the Guru. I put it like that because there is a, see, there is Murphy's law. I suppose it is Murphy's law. If not Murphy's law, then Patterson's law, some other person's law. Murphy's law. The Murphy's law is if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. If something you are likely to misinterpret, you will misinterpret. That's why I was very circumspect about it. Therefore, you do not convert the whole blessed thing into guru dumb. That is my uh, my exhortation. And so, so in the name of Shraddha. So, Shraddha is translated by a Mahatma as intense enthusiasm for for what? For truth. And for the pointing finger. So, this is Shraddha. And then, uh, how can we have Shraddha? You see, you don't, uh, uh, you don't put yourself into what is called uh, um, uh, Nyunyashraya. So, you don't put yourself into uh, a circular uh, uh, situation where you cannot come out of it. So, there is a name for it. So, like what? So, unless I have Shraddha, I cannot know the truth. And unless I know the truth, I cannot have this Shraddha. So don't put yourself into that kind of a um, argument, because it is self-defeating argument. Suppose I ask you, give up the egoity. You don't need the ego. Suppose you come with an argument. Who has to give up the ego? The one who has to give up the ego is the ego. Therefore, ego cannot give itself up. Therefore, you cannot give up ego. Therefore, we have to keep the ego. And therefore, we have to remain egoic. Okay. If that is how you want to be satisfied with it, be like that. So, 
you you are very clever so you use an argument to defeat the purpose ultimately it is not about the argument it is about the truth now can i give up ego or not yes i can it is as simple as that i can but this argument suppose i i hold on to this argument then i remain egoic all through life so you should not do that so here in shraddha there is a condition the condition is you have to take the first step satya buddhya avadharana this uh, this teaching is the truth this uh, person is the guru so he is the right guru and this is the right teaching so this uh, this is the buddhi this is the understanding that is called satya buddhi you should have it now is that not a trap because you look at a teaching and you look at a person who is doing the teaching the guru and his upadesha and i have to take it as real uh, so even without knowing the truth i have to take all this as the truth truthful and so i have to pursue that is that not a, a, a trap a likely trap if it is true then i am okay if it is not true then i will be in trouble so then what kind of shraddha are you talking about now the point is you need to take it as the truth the right one the right teaching the right teacher you need to take it uh, so that he is the right teacher he or she the right teacher and that is the right teaching you have to take it only provisionally namely in the first step and uh, as as you take the teaching and the teacher in the first step may take the first step in that direction there is so much energy generated by that first step or in that first step that you will have all the energy required for taking the second step but suppose no energy is generated in the first step you can go away therefore shraddha is going to help you it is not going to hurt you for example you do surya namaskar early morning you do surya namaskar it will keep you physically and mentally healthy if not spiritually also it will keep you mentally and physically and mentally healthy suppose i say and i, I am also willing to show you how to do surya namaskar now what all you have to do you know but all you have to do is do two or three surya namaskars that is all you have to do and see what happens if there is no there is no there is no impact you need not do any more you go you see i tried i remember even now i went to a yoga teacher not uh, now long 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 back and uh, he told me you do surya namaskar so i have done two times two times i have done then he asked me how do you feel i looked at myself i feel like feather light very light when i came early morning i got up i slept for a while and got up and came had a cup of tea and rushed to the class and so did not take bath because i did not have time so i was feeling a uh, kind of uh, heavy in the body because of sleep the tamoguna was still there and i was feeling heavy and so i mechanically did uh, two times surya namaskar by following his advice and then i looked at myself i was feeling light like feather so a feeling of lightness in the body is not a small thing because people feel the body in the body quite heavy generally not all they feel heavy in the body whereas i even after uh, only i was sleeping uh, just uh, 15 minutes back i was in sleep and i got up from the sleep and came here instead of feeling uh, heavy in the body i felt light in the body uh, surya namaskar is something you try yourself this is called uh, but to try you have to take my word for for the truth that much you have to do
what i said is the truth and i am the right person to telling telling the right thing you should accept that much and do surya namaskar twice or thrice and see what happens from then on i need not tell you to do surya namaskar you will do it yourself that first initial stage where you have to take the first step and for that you need the right mindset and that is called shraddha and suppose in the first step you do not feel great you may as well give up or if you want to just give benefit of doubt some more and try one more time and if it is not okay for for you it is not for you you can give it up so you have a right to give up similarly suppose you attend a, a class either the class or any class of spirituality there are many classes available in the world so you don't ask the question there are so many classes are available which one i have to attend you don't ask that question you should have the wisdom to begin with to judge the right one generally where there is too much paraphernalia etc uh, you can see uh, something is wrong with it uh, because uh, truth is simple and truth is uh, the, sim- the whatever is simple is beautiful that is the beauty there is a beauty in simple in simple things and truth is always simple it is never complex truth is simple human mind makes it very complex therefore see you, this much wisdom you should have this much insight you should have so uh, how is the guy and uh, then uh, uh, so how, how is the setting here the setting the guy the setting it is simple and uh, uh, there is no showiness showy or ostentatiousness is not there there is nothing ostentatious about it it is simple and uh, there are no pretensions there is no extravaganza uh, and immediately you should pay attention to that and then you pay attention and uh, follow whatever initial steps are required like you take a class or two or if it is yoga attend a session or two to do that with a with a good mind you do it with uh, some faith you do it satya buddhya avadharana do it and then see what happens to you in whose presence your mind becomes quiet less excited less agitated that person is your uh, teacher you can take it a preceptor you can uh, take advice from that person and uh, if the other person has an agenda or he is trying to push something your way and that becomes a burden to you if some or if he is trying to give you you give you a belief if he is pulling you into a belief which is not uh, enlightenment you have already your own beliefs and one more belief if some such thing is going on then uh, you can give it up you, you don't pursue it therefore you should have that basic wisdom in you that basic insight some kind of understanding you should have you cannot be an ignoramus at you know, all the way to begin with you cannot be like that you should have some kind of uh, uh, insight some idea and then apply these principles of simplicity uh, absence of ostentatiousness and uh, no showiness uh there is a peace and serenity in the person and uh, the teaching helps you to look at yourself with uh, uh, some insight it helps you to understand life it helps you to steer through the vicissitudes of life uh, with some courage and all that then that is the teaching for you you have to make that judgment and uh, so what you need is shraddha i have explained enough so it can go on like that but a shraddha is a, the the capital that that is the enthusiasm that you need to take the very first step 
Therefore, that is what is called the capital. Shraddha Vittaha, that is how the Shivati says. So, let us uh, say the verse one time. Shastrasya Guru Vakyasya Satya Buddhya Vadharanam Sashraddha Kathita Sadbhihi Yaya Vastu Palabhyate That Yaya Vastu Palabhyate By which is Shraddha One comes to know the truth That is the That expression uh, that particular uh, one, one, that quarter of the verse, it is the uh, it is the explanation of the etymology of the word. Shraddhiti Satyanama Shrat Dadhati It is Shraddha. That is the etymology of the word. That etymology the Acharya has captured in one quarter of the verse. Yaya Vastu Upalabhyate By which mental attitude you are sure to gain the truth. Vastu is the truth. <coughs> then, then Samadhana. We have discussed these things in detail. Just I am going through the verses now. But all to be discussed, already discussed in good detail. And also with some repetition. Samyadasthapanam buddhehe Shuddhe Brahmane Sarvada Tat Samadhana Mityuttam Natu Chittasya Lalanam So Samadhana So you approach the mind and then dabble with it. You appease it. Appease it means whatever the mind wants to go along with it. The mind wants to pursue a desire to go along with it. You support it. Because, you, I tell you, the mind doesn't have the power. The power is with you. You see, uh, there is a saying in marketing, even the best marketing person of this world, even the best businessman of this world, cannot sell you a thing unless you buy it. That is what is said. So, ultimately, you are the master of the situation. He may do all that he can. He is very, very efficient in his job, this marketing guy. He will do maximum effort he will put into it. But, ultimately, it is not his effort which matters. It is your willingness to buy that alone matters. Therefore, suppose there is a desire. It is not the desire which binds you. It is you who hook yourself to the desire. And an emotional mind is there. People give the emotional mind enormous power by identifying with the emotional mind. They are out to appease their emotions. They have a certain emotion. Now that emotion has to be taken care of. It has to be fulfilled. And uh, if that emotion is hurt, then that emotional hurt has to be repaired by a new set of uh, right kind of emotions. So that is a field in which people work all their life. And uh, they want uh, the world, the relations, the family, the guru, and the religion to support them in their pursuit of the emotional field. That is how they operate. How come the emotions have such an overwhelming power? You see, everybody has an emotion. Who doesn't have emotion? Suppose you put a mala in my neck, I feel uh, ple ple pleasant. And suppose you censure me, I feel a bit unhappy. Who, who doesn't have emotions? Everybody has emotion. But then uh, I so badly identify with the emotional field and I get stuck in that emotional field. That is not proper. So, you are not supposed to do such a thing. 
so whether it is fear you see nothing can make you afraid until you identify with that thing in itself it doesn't have power whether it is desire or fear therefore you have to understand eh, the mind doesn't have power over you it is you who has power over the mind and uh, suppose mind is persecuting you mind is bothering you where from the mind has got the power to bother you that power is given to the mind by you generally they give an example of a wound or a carbuncle you know a growth on this on the tissue it has grown and now it is very painful it could be malignant also malignant or benign some growth is there and it is painful and uh, this growth uh, that that grown tissue uh, that uh, it it uh, it gets all its nutrition it needs blood supply and all that you know it needs nutrients blood supply all that it gets from the body and then persecutes the body the emotions are like that they get their sanction their energy their power from you how by identification and having acquired all the power from you they make life measurable for you so the job is very easy withdraw the power don't empower them don't give them power just leave them alone so don't do this alanam of chitta suppose you go to a mahatma and say mahatma ji my brother in law is misbehaving with me in a way is i am feeling very unhappy and very hurt now what mahatma can do about it the mahatma has to uh, console you he has to offer his shoulder so that you can cry upon it or he has to call your brother in law and try to put some sense into his head or both is that the way to treat a mahatma you want the mahatma to sympathize with you is that all you want from a mahatma i think more than that only sympathization sympathy you want you you should not be a victim of emotionalism like that don't do that not to chittasya lalanam don't do this lalanam this uh, uh, like a, a like a boy becomes so naughty when the people when the parents say so appease him he becomes so naughty the mind becomes like that don't do that so you stand in command of the mind that is called samadhana you stand in command of the mind and uh, you don't empower the mind let the mind be silent once you stop empowering the mind it remains silent you watch the mind what will happen you try when your mind is very agitated you find such a context all the time you have a cell phone with you right and so it rings and you listen to it and the mind gets agitated you don't need anything other than that cell phone so the mind somebody says something and therefore your mind gets agitated and then what you do is you sit quietly upright so that the alertness comes up and then watch the mind how to watch the mind there is no how you try you try you, you can try you know suppose i ask you watch the mind you say i don't know but suppose i say try to watch the mind now you cannot say i don't know you can also say you can only say i won't try then it's all right therefore you try and see what happens so eventually you find the mind becomes slowly becoming slow and then becomes altogether quiet and then uh, there is an awareness of what is around till then you are not aware of what is around 
Suppose you are talking with, uh, talking, uh, you are fighting with your partner or uh, whatever uh, on the cell phone, standing uh, inside the Taj Mahal. What will happen to you? Will you be aware of the beauty of the Taj Mahal? You, you will not be aware of the beauty of the Taj Mahal. You, you will be consumed by that emotion, emotional fight going on with your, uh, the other guy on the other end of the line. So, so you are not aware. I ask you, did you have, were you ever aware of a dry leaf falling? You should try. Were you ever aware of a raindrop falling and making a small sound of a splutter on the ground? Were you aware of a coolie carrying a heavy load on his head and walking in the sun? Generally, we are not aware of any of these things because we are busy with our own uh, imagined world. You talk of a world as if it is something real. Don't you know what you call a world is entirely a projection of your mind? Therefore, so you, you are not aware of the nature around you. You see, um, in America, they all rush to Vermont estate uh, to see the colors in the spring. Spring or fall, fall, not spring, fall. Then I noticed that around our ashram, in the village where we live, under the, the road on which we drive, it is a mini Vermont uh, itself. You need not go to Vermont for that. But you need to be aware of what is around you. Why people go to Vermont? Because where they are, they are consumed by their samsara, they cannot be aware of what is around them. Therefore, they have to run away from home and travel a few hundred miles and separate themselves from the home and office and family also if necessary and then uh, put themselves in an idyllic place where somehow they are able to drop their projections that is Vermont or Uti or Nainital or uh, Darjeeling in India and then oh nature is very beautiful nature is very beautiful in their backyard also but only thing is they did not have the samadhana so that awareness in the backyard because they are in the midst of samsara. Whereas when they run away from samsara a few hundred miles physically, that burden of samsara comes down a little. Thereby the awareness improves a, a, a bit and then they are aware of the beauty of uh, the nature. So, uh, therefore, if you, uh, every beach is beautiful. Not only Waikiki beach is beautiful, every beach is beautiful. The beach in your uh, community is equally beautiful. You need not go to Hanu, uh, Hawaii for that. Like that, something like that. So, you stop dabbling with your mind all the time. Give, empowering your mind. Don't do that. Go beyond the mind. The mind cannot give you the truth. Please understand the limitation of the mind. It cannot give you the truth. You rely upon your mind for giving you the truth. It is like relying upon the thief to protect your wealth. He will rob. He will not protect it. Therefore, go beyond. How to go beyond? Now, you need not practice any Hatha Yoga and all that. It is enough. You grow into awareness. How to grow into awareness? Two ways. While you are looking outside and while you are looking inside. While you are looking outside, you learn the knack of looking around out of awareness, not out of the mind which is a collective of Namarupa. Like you look at a bird. Don't try to name it. Don't try to give a name to it. This is PGN. Okay. You know that. 
what kind of knowledge it is? This is PGM. Okay. Oh, you are a very knowledgeable person. True. So you have you have responded to the thing there from your intellect, which knows the name of the bird. And you may also know a little more about the PGM. If you if you are a zoologist, you will know a little more about the PGM. All that you project there. That doesn't help you. Just don't name the bird. Can you look at a thing without the intervention of Nama Rupa? Just stay with that question. It is same as asking the question in a slightly different way. Can you look at a thing without the intervention of the mind? You have to do that. It is something like I look at that wall or whatever is there on the wall and I do not allow the mind to intervene. The mind gets baffled to begin with because when, when I start looking at something, the mind has to come and associate itself immediately and provide the category, the name the associated with the form. So I brings the form and mind provides the name and then the job is done. The mind is, uh, it, it is, uh, it, it has done its piece and it is ready for the next job. That is what the mind is doing. Now, I keep my eyes wide open and uh, I do not allow the blinking to, to bring the, some alertness into this scheme. And so I keep the eyes wide open, not more wide than normal. And then I am looking at the outer thing and I do not allow the mind to intervene. It is something like I am looking at those letters, but I am not reading them. I am not recognizing them. I don't allow the mind to come and intervene. This is called Shambhavi Mudra. Must have heard some of it. Maybe sometimes you must have heard. Shambhavi Mudra. Look at a thing without the intervention of the mind. Then what happens, you know? Now, it is not the normal seeing in which there is the seen. There is seen only when there is the self-conscious fear. Without the self-conscious, meaning the body identified seer, there cannot be the seen. Seer and seen come together. Now, when I suspended the seen, the seen is not there because I don't allow the mind to intervene. There is no seen. When there is no seen, the seer also drops. You are not self-conscious anymore. And then, you discover, when this seer seen duality ends, you discover there is a connectedness. Because in duality there is a division. Now the division has ended and there is a connectedness. Somebody was asking me a question in the satsang, what is Akhandakara Vritti? I gave some brief reply. Now I, I, I would uh, ask you to think about it further. So, don't worry about an expression. It is just an expression. So, think about it. When you are looking at a thing without the intervention of the mind, meaning without the intervention of the Namarupa, then the never known division is not there. And there is a sense of connectedness, meaning it is the being which happens to be my own being. Therefore, when I look at a bird that way, the bird is the being which is not different from the being which is myself. There is a connectedness because in being we are all connected. In Nama Rupa we are all divided. So you live with the mind, in the mind, you live by the mind, you remain divided. Your thinking will be fragmented and you live in division. Whereas, you rise above the mind, be awareful. In that awarefulness, you inst intuitively find the oneness of being. I am looking at a cloud, I am looking at the sun. The Rishi was looking at the sun with total awareness. 
and suddenly he discovers, he sees that what is in this sun, sun is Nama Rupa, you should be able to keep the Nama Rupa aside. What is the essence, what is essentially the being of the sun is indeed the essential being in the heart. That is the Gayatri Mantra. This is the Akhandakara. There is no Khanda now. Therefore, when you are looking at the world, be awareful. Grow into awarefulness. Don't dabble with the mind all the time. Grow into awarefulness while you are looking at the mind. Uh, looking at the world. This is called Brahma Sarga Viveka. Suppose I am looking at Ganga. So first I say it is Ganga. Then I say this Ganga is on Shiva's head. And then uh, there was a conflict between Ganga and Shiva, Ganga and Parvati, because both happen to be the consorts of Shiva. So what are you doing now? You are Loka, Puranam is called Lokanuvada. So there was bigamy in the society. And so the two, li two ladies married to the same guy. And so they always fight among themselves. So all that you are taking to Shiva. Is that not what you are doing? Are Abba, leave that story alone. There must be some message in that story. We will see that. So, don't use the word Ganga to go into all that uh, mythology. And you call it knowledge. So now that knowledge has become an eclipse for you. You, are, you have, It has eclipsed the Samadha. So this is how knowledge becomes an eclipse. I look at Ganga and now the word Ganga drops because I am not looking at Ganga with the mind. I am not cognizing Ganga. That is what mind does. So I cognize Ganga. Mind is an instrument of cognition. You should know that. The word Pramana has to be translated as an instrument of cognition. Suppose you say, I is the Pramana. You translate it. How do you translate it? Suppose you translate it as pram, uh, instrument, prama, Pramayaha Karanam Pramanam. The Karana it is. Karanam Yutpati it is called. So, ane, Anena Pramiyate it is Pramanam. Karanam Yutpati. Pramayaha Karanam. Karanam is instrument, tool. So, I is Pramana. You translate it. I ask you. You translate it. How would you translate? So, the, the tool of knowledge, but you have given a kind of a, uh, a kind of a ambiguous translation. I is a tool of knowledge, alright. I am not saying anything against it. I would prefer to call it a tool of uh, knowing the form, shape. Be precise. So, a tool of seeing, that is I, eyesight. And ears, ears, a tool of hearing. Everything is knowledge, Japa, but it is a tool of hearing, very precisely. Nose, the tool of picking up the smell. Don't say tool of smelling, that sounds a bit odd. Then what is the mind? In the same way, a tool of cognition. That is what the mind is. Mind is pramana. Thought is pramana. Pramana for what? The tool of cognition. And in every cognition there is a division. The knower and the known. Knower is the self-conscious person. Known is the physical object with a shape and nama, nama rupa. This is called divisive thinking. Can you go beyond that by looking at the world? That is called samadhana. Brahma, Sarga, Viveka. Brahma is the being, Sarga is the Nama Rupa. And so when you are aware of, when you are awareful, instead of getting attached to the Nama Rupa, you are connecting yourself to the Brahma, to the being. That's why there is a connectedness. What I am is uh, somehow connected to what I am looking at. 
that connectedness, akhanda, there is no division now, akhanda, that akhanda comes, doesn't come through mind, because mind intervenes, it eclipses the akhanda, by positing, positing means putting in place, by positing, no known duality, that is what the mind does, go beyond the mind, you can do it, initially the mind gets baffled, but eventually it settles down. Practice Shambhavi Mudra. Open eye meditation. So I look at the Ganga. Then it is not Ganga anymore. It's a river. It's not river anymore. It is Apaha. It's not Apaha anymore. It's a presence. You are now in communion with Brahma. And you happen to be also presence. I am is a presence. And somehow the presence which is there and the presence which is, which is here are not divided. Somehow. They are somehow connected. And you intuitively commune with that connectedness. That is called Samadhana. Therefore, Samadhana is a knack of looking at the world without the fragmentation of the mind. That is the Samadhana. Mind is fragmentational. That is how mind is. Mind functions by fragmentation. Don't depend upon mind to tell you the oneness of truth. It cannot. Because it's only an instrument of cognition. And all cognition is in the form of a duality, subject-object duality. Therefore, this is the knack of looking at the world. Brahma, Sarga, Viveka, by Samadhana. Then look at yourself. How do you look at yourself? You have the very origin of everything in your own being. Suppose I say, I am Swami, Swami TV they call me, I am Swami TV, which is first, I am or Swami TV? I am is first, I, I am is primordial and Swami TV is an addition to that. Coming from where? From the mind, from the identification, from the mind. I am is not coming from the mind. I am is coming from a source which is your God soul, which is your divinity. That is the Brahma. I am is coming from that source. So, I am comes from there and you attach Swami TV to that and make it a person. And then the person has circumstances, the immediate. My home, my wife, my children, all that is there for the person. Now I am becomes totally uh, ensnared in the details of the person. Totally ensnared. So that is not the way to look at yourself. Oh, I am hurt. Come on, you are not hurt. You are not the mind. You are not the emotional mind. I am a scholar. No, come on, you are not a scholar. You are not the scholarly intellect. You are not the ego. Be aware of your own being. Don't be carried away by your identifications which are put in place by the ignorant mind. Learn to be impersonal. You see, when you identify with the mind or body or intellect, you are a person. Identified with the body, you, are a, you have a gender, and then you are an Indian, you are a Brahmana, Kshatriya, this, that. Identified with the mind, you are a bundle of emotions. You have a past. Mind is the past. You have a past. And you are worried about your future. That is what you, you end up as when you identify with the mind. Identify with the intellect. Now you are many things. You have equipped your intellect like people 
with resources, equip their drawing rooms, their kitchen, etc. Like that you equip your intellect. Furnish your intellect. And identify with the intellect. And say, I am a scholar. Or something at, at the other. Th that is not your true being. That is again, the ignorant mind with its, all, with its uh, all kinds of identifications. So, you be aware of your own pure being, Ahamasmi, non-verbal sense of being. Hold on to that sense of I am, the feeling I am, not the sentence I am, not the words I am, non-verbal feeling of I am. That is, that is uh, the reflection of the truth in the body-mind. Hold on to that. That is called a Samadhana. Simply, when you remain silent, and when I say just be, and you be, be awareful, I need not say, you are, the being is awareful in any case, but I say like that, to make it more clear, just be, just be awareful, just be yourself, the non-verbal I am, be that. All of that is a verbal meditation. And uh, that is Samadhana. This is how you learn the knack of moving out of the divisive mind, the fragmentary mind or the fragmentary thinking into Undivided, indivisible sense of being with the help of Samadhana. This, this Samadhana you have to acquire. And when you acquire this Samadhana, then uh, the Shastra tells Brahma Satyam Jagan Mithya. You intuitively know, yes, that is how it is. Otherwise, you make a, a scholastic effort of Satyam and Mitya for a decade and yet remain a bag of bones. Therefore, Samadhana is the thing that takes you into the truth, into the realm of reality. Therefore, you acquire that quality. Then you are ready for taking off for the realization of the truth. So, that is how I, I have made it a, a brief account because I have a, uh, if I remember correctly, I was uh, uh, focusing on this Samadhana from day one. And therefore, uh, we have done justice to the topic also. Let us say the verse, Samyaga Sthapanam Buddhehe Shuddhe Brahmane Sarvada. So, Brahman is the pure being, whether it is the substratum of the Namarupas of the outside world or the substratum of your own inner reality. Not the substratum, in your own inner reality. Tat Samadhanam Ityuktam Natu Chittasyalalanam. So that completes Shamadi Shat, Shatka Sampatti. Now that leaves Mumukshutvam. In fact, that doesn't leave Mumukshutvam. Mumukshutvam we have done adequately. But still, we will say the verse. Ahankaradi Dehantan Bandhana Jnana Kalpitan Swasvarupa Vabodhena Moktu Mitya Mumukshuta. So I will explain it for a few minutes and I take a few more minutes than the usual time, like, uh, like we have done almost every day. Only thing is our lunch will be delayed a little, on that count. So, Moktu Mitya, don't put it to desire and all that. As Swami, you told that desire we have to give up, but now you are talking of desire. So don't make it a technical like that. Don't uh, stand on the jargon. And um, so, 
Don't uh, rely upon the semantics of it. Try to get the spirit of it. So, are you willing to become be free or not? That is the question. Are you, do you want to be free or not? People don't want to be free. I told you, people want wealth. No, no. Uh, instead of being uh, poor and free, I prefer to be wealthy and bought. How is that? So, uh, you see, somebody was uh, very greedy and accumulating wealth. And then, uh, uh, somebody told him, as you are accumulating wealth, you will be insecure. A lot of insecurity will come. Then he said, first let me accumulate wealth. And then uh, when, it, when uh, the insecurity issues crop up, I will deal with them at that time. Because I can put up a bigger compound wall, higher compound wall, and can put uh, some very vicious uh, glass pieces or uh, iron hooks, etc. around the compound wall. And then I can have a Doberin or a dog imported from Germany or whatever. And then I will have security companies up there. I can engage one of them. They will have electronic security around. I will issue, deal with those insecurity problems when I come to that. But first let me become wealthy. Therefore, people don't want freedom. The Bhoga people, you ask them, you want to be free? Because these Bhogas, you are caught in them badly. So you want to be free from that? No, no, we will see that. After retirement, we will see. So the religious guy, I tell you, a person who is devoted to his rituals, he knows what he de- he has to desire. What he should desire, he knows. He is very sure what all I want, I am very sure. It is said that a person who is very sure of what he wants, you cannot put enlightenment into his he is very sure what he wants. And he has all kinds of rituals and gods and goddesses available for fulfilling his desires. And he knows what he wants. So, this ritualist, you cannot, he doesn't want freedom. Are rituals are bondage? You tell him? No. You cannot uh, make him see that. So, something has to happen. And he will get a knock on the head and then he will shake his head and he will come out of it. It has to happen. In fact, mostly people come into Vedanta that way only. There is, probably there is no other way. Because we never learn from pleasure. We only learn from pain. And uh, the few fortunate people who have learned from pain end up in a Vedanta class. And most of the worldly people who never learn anything from their pain, they live a life of endless pain, repeated pain. Uh, therefore, this desire for freedom is a very, very big thing it is. It is the fourth. We have come to the zenith of sadhana, that you seek freedom wholeheartedly, with all your being. You seek freedom. Freedom is not political freedom or physical freedom. They are not the freedom that we are talking about. We are not talking of independence and all that. That is different. So, um, when uh, you see, um, Mahatma Gandhi and Ramana Maharshi were contemporaries. They met. And they had a small dialogue also with each other. So, Mahatma Gandhi said, for the present I am pursuing independence. Whereas, you are an embodiment of freedom. So, Ramana Maharshi is an embodiment of freedom. Not independence, freedom. Mahatma Gandhi, in his uh, life, he took upon himself the pursuit of independence. They are two different things. So, freedom. And uh, so, somebody asked Ramana Maharshi, why don't you join freedom, independence struggle? He said, it's okay. I will, I will think about it. So, <laughs> because there is a difference between independence and freedom. All that I said, uh, not to cast the aspersions on any personality, just to highlight the importance of the freedom versus independence. So, you want freedom. Moktum Icha. 
okay i want freedom you see having chosen freedom as the goal you come to vedanta okay you have taken a very bold step taking bold step is not the same as taking the right step you know you have taken the bold step now having done that you have fulfilled the qualification then you have to take the right step the right step is you see having come to vedanta i study all the scriptures spend 10 years or 20 years and study all the scriptures and then uh, occupy a seat of uh, acharya or whatever you call it as the head of a uh, institution and build a huge ego about it then that means you never wanted the freedom really you wanted a profession and you have chosen vedanta as a profession you are a professional vedantin not a freedom lover they are not the same so then what is this freedom you see you have to become free from body now is the body real it is not real the freedom is never from the real you have to become free from the fear of serpent right what kind of serpent it is not the real serpent and therefore body is not real i don't have time for these things so body is is an idea in the mind what kind of mind ignorant mind so body is unreal you identify with the unreal satyanuruta mithuni karanam it is bhashyakara so it is the mix up of the real with the unreal so you identify with the body and so you want to be free from the body identification then you are a candidate for vedanta you want to be free from identification with the mind or you want to keep your bundle of emotions and mind identification intact what do you want i want to freedom from the mind i don't want to carry this monkey on my head all the time i want to become free from the mind then you are a candidate you want to become free from your intellect or not or you want the intellect to save you intellect is not going to save you you have to become free from the intellect can help you like pointing finger is not the moon and if you take the pointing finger as the moon then you miss the moon therefore if you take the scholarship of the intellect the furnishing of the intellect they will give you titles the more you furnish the intellect the more titles you will get you get the prestige in the society name everybody says you are great and you feel very pleasant about it and then you get wealth also when you are a great scholar so is that what you want or you want freedom from all that people want all that they don't want freedom from all that if you want freedom from all that you are a candidate from vedanta then there is the person ahankara the person so i tell you it is freedom not for the person it is moksha not for the person it is moksha freedom from the person so unless you don't know that uh, small shift there is no freedom for the person as long as you are seeking freedom for the person you are seeking wrongly it is always the freedom from the person so please be warned by the time you get this freedom you get this knowledge you will not be there are you ready for it this is the highest surrender self sacrifice highest self sacrifice you will not be there no no i will get moksha and i will enjoy moksha you will not be there and there will be no enjoyment of moksha also moksha is not a thing to be enjoyed are you ready for that kind of a sacrifice for that kind of a freedom then you are the candidate for moksha om purnamada purnamidam